Not yet. Ah, now it is. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we are we are here. We are at sort of um, our last case study uh, before we have our closing and wrap up for today. Um, so there's been a lot of talk over the last few days about being a change agent. Um, there's also been a lot of discussion about otherness, all the different ways of othering that happens, um, as well as the power of art to create pathways uh, between communities in order to heal. So I'm excited uh, to introduce you to a change agent. 30 years ago, Judith Smith set change in motion when she founded Axis Dance Company bringing together disabled and non-disabled artists to make physically integrated dance. Since then, the company has traveled literally all over the world uh, and pioneered integrated dance training programs and engagement activities in communities around the country. Last year in 2016, Judith engineered the first ever national convening on the future of physically integrated dance in the US, which was followed by a series of regional convenings uh, that took place throughout 2016, no doubt catalyzing even more change in their wake. I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the national convening um, in New York in May of last year, as well as the New England Regional Convening, which was organized with uh, Deborah Cash and the Boston Dance Alliance at NIFA. Judy and Axis have a long history with NIFA and the National Dance Project. Axis received their very first National Dance Project grant in 2003 for a work by acclaimed choreographer and NDP recipient, Victoria Marks, who's somewhere out here. Uh, that work was called Dust. And since then, they've gone on to receive four more NDP grants, distinguishing them as one out of only 20 out of nearly 350 companies who have received five or more grants in NDP's 20-year history. Uh, in 2014, Axis was awarded support for To Go Again, which we're about to see. To Go Again is choreographed by Joe Good, uh, and Judy specifically sought out Joe uh, for this project. It's their third collaboration um, in over 17 years. Joe himself is also an NDP recipient and an award-winning choreographer who's made a huge impact on contemporary dance with his work that collides music, text, and movement in stunning dance theater works that really explore what it means to be human. With NDP support, To Go Again reached seven communities, from Texas to Tennessee, and it kept going long after their NDP support had been exhausted. They'll be at Boston University later this week on March 18th. To Go Again explores resilience following severe life changes and brings to light issues facing our nation's veterans and their families and friends. Judy spoke up yesterday to remind all of us that the disability community holds a vast body of knowledge that needs to be integrated into the conversations, the connections, and the actions we take as a result of our time together this weekend. And with that charge in mind, it's my honor to introduce Judith Smith, Joe Good, and Axis Dance Company. Good morning. Is everyone loving the weather? I'm from California, and I moved from Colorado to avoid this stuff. Um, I really want to thank NIFA and Doris Duke and Andrew Mellon, who have been huge supporters of AXIS and this convening and just work that's uh, change-making work that's happening all over the country. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with AXIS, we are based in Oakland, California, not San Francisco. And we're in our 30th year. Our mission is to change the face of dance and disability. And we do that in three ways. First and foremost, through performing and creating 
um, contemporary dance. We also do a lot of education and engagement. I think that we've become one of the primary pre-professional training grounds for disabled dancers in the U.S. and possibly internationally as well. Um, I have to say that To Go Again is really one of my very, very favorite works that I've commissioned. I think there have been over 25. And um, it's my final work for stage before I, well, I turn the artistic director reins over to Mr. Mark Brew um, in January. And I think like a lot of people, you know, I've been very disturbed by the war and being disabled, especially by the number of vets that are coming back with both visible and invisible disabilities. And um, I think like a lot of artists, you know, we, want, we wanted to do something, want to do something to um, help. And uh, in 2013, no, it was earlier than that, 2000 or 11 or 12, we were approached by Palo Alto Veterans Hospital to help um, in a study of vets who have spinal cord injuries and how social dance could impact their reintegration into society. So that was kind of my first contact with the veteran community. And in 2012, I was approached by a man named Jeff Fallon, who is a retired lawyer and ex-military. I believe he was an officer, wasn't he? Yeah, and he wanted to commission AXIS. He flew to Colum from Columbus, Ohio to do a work about vets, and in sp specifically disabled vets. And he sought AXIS out because we are a, a company of dancers with and without disabilities. And I was rather intimidated you know, by the idea of, of doing a piece about vets. And I said, well, if I was going to do it, I would, I would want to work with Joe. Um, and when I contacted Joe in 2013, it was in the fall, and synchronistically, he had just done his resilience project um, in Kansas with veterans. So it was just, and I was actually really relieved because I was so intimidated by how we were going to do this piece and how we were going to do it respectfully, and it was, I was so glad to know that Joe already kind of knew what he was doing. <laughs> Um, to Go Again has actually been seen in 20 cities now, and I am hoping that it remains in the repertory, and that will be um, up to mark, but it's been a really important piece for us, and in conjunction to um, performing it, we've done uh, workshops with veterans around the country where we've taken the piece and shown it informally, um, mostly at VA hospitals and veteran centers. Um, and I've specifically made those closed workshops so that we could create a safe container for veterans um, and their families. And um, it's, I, I think it's been uh, the dancers who you'll meet at the end, um, I think they will tell you that it's one of their uh, most impactful experiences um, doing engagement work. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Um, as Judy said, I had just met Art de Groot. Is he here today? Where are you? Oh, um, in Kansas, uh, and I had done a work there, and was just kind of beginning to understand that I there was a conversation that I could have with veterans. Um, I'm a gay Buddhist choreographer from San Francisco. I'm a lesbian atheist. <laughs> so so I, I'm not sure, I, you know, I always open with that, with the vets, it, it bonds us. Um, so it's been a journey for me to understand what that conversation was. And the Resilience Project really, I've really approached the vets as teachers about this thing called resilience. Um, I don't, yet feel empowered to approach them as someone who can heal their trauma or be even fully understand it, but um, to approach them as teachers and ask them for their 
knowledge uh, and these oral histories, conversations with food, as we've discussed, um, have been really, really amazing for me, and I've learned a lot. I feel very gifted. So to, to Go Again is based on conversations that we did at the VA hospital in Livermore and kind of around the country. One of the dancers is a vet, and we use some of his personal contacts um, to do some of the interviews. Um, and it was, um, it was brilliant for me to work with a mixed ability company on this work because there is, there are some parallels. There is some stigma that is parallel to what, to what the, you know, what the military people feel sometimes. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, being disabled, you know something about being resilient. So there was that uh, intuitive connection. Um, before we begin, I'm going to go through a little exercise with these folks. Okay. Ask you to do a little resilience practice with me that I made up. I'm all about the body practices. That's my territory. Um, so if you will indulge me, and I've done this with several different groups, um, often military groups and their families. I should also say the Resilience Project, this is scaring me. The Resilience Project is um, really interviews with vets and their families. <laughs> uh, so um, we, uh, we always include the families, and in, in, both in the in the oral history part of it, but in all all the all the steps of the journey. So, if you can just place your hands on your thighs and your feet on the floor, take a couple of clearing breaths, not theatrical breaths, but listening breaths, listening to your own breath, feeling it. And then we're just going to rub those hands on the thighs and create a little heat. So this is the part of bringing energy and vitality into the body, bringing a little belief into the body. I'm still here. And then the next part, um, if you're like me and you're bespectacled cold, you have to take them off. I like to hang them here like grandma. Um, grandma used to have like two or three pairs. <laughs> I'd be like, which one of those are you wearing? Um, so one more time, rub the hands, get them nice and hot. And then take the heel of the hand and, or any part of the hand and place it over the eyes. And here we're just going to think of excoriating, burning out, all of the repetitive thinking, the, the tape loop of who you are or who you aren't, what you need, what you like, what you want. Just let it all go for a second, sort of burn it out, creating an empty space. And then we'll just open the gates. And I, I would leave my eyes closed, but you might want to look at me to see what I'm doing. And imagine that fresh new perspective can come in. That's part of being resilient. You can keep playing the tape of your hardship, or you can let some gentle new perspective float in. And then the final step really is just to send that out. Every veteran that I've spoken to said their real healing began when they started to share it, when they started to talk about it, spread it around with others. So let's do that one more time, the whole process. A few couple of gentle breaths, listening to the breath. They're mine. What is the tempo? What is the temperature? of those breaths, and then a little heat. 
bringing vitality and energy. I need to wake up to do this work of being resilient. And then cover the eyes, burn out the monkey mind, the unnecessary loop that plays and plays. And open the gates and allow some gentle, fresh thing to fall in there. You don't have to know what it is. It'll just come into the emptiness. And then finally, share it. Send it out. You're not in this alone. So thank you. Now you can all move to San Francisco. Where it's warmer. And, and the woo-woo hippies. Yeah. Um, I think we'll just show, show you what, 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 yeah, we, did, what we did. Yeah, to go again. Combat injured veteran, U.S. Navy, Desert Storm. Mother of a veteran daughter who suffered a traumatic brain injury, Iraq. Mechanics contacts leader, spinal cord injury, Iraq. Military daughter, wife, and now mother of disabled veteran, Afghanistan. These are some of the stories, some of the words that will be spoken, and speaking them matters. It was devastating. It was my whole world. At that time, what I thought was my whole world just collapsed. From the physical aspect of being an athlete my whole life, and thinking I wouldn't be an athlete again. These are real words from real people, people who have lived through difficult circumstances, but who doesn't have difficult circumstances. And every time we stop, we go again. Thank you, yes. The recovery is going well. To me, it seems it's going slow, but it's going slow in the right direction. Yes, I wake up and feel like that I'm doing good. So I need to keep on going forwards. Real words. Real people. I think there were a lot of things that played into the dark times. One that is almost the hardest, that I always kind of stuffed down. That I lost two of my good friends in the same incident. Because who doesn't have difficult circumstances? In this war, in this conflict, everyone faces obstacles. Everybody goes through these kinds of things. And sometimes, it's how we get through those things. They had us on patrols every day after 9-11. They postponed our graduation of advanced tank training um, because of it. There was only one door in the entire barracks that was open. 
The rest of them were tape shut, slam shut, lock shut. When you came in the front door of the Marine Barracks, there was a, an M16 with a grenade launcher on it looking out the front door. No pistols, no flags, no nothing. If we didn't like you, we'd blow you up in the parking lot. We had guys on the roof. Sniper watch. Our patrols were mostly around the gates. We would look for bombs. That's what we do. We knew. We were already amped. We felt our hearts pumping. We might actually get to use all this training. She was just not getting any better. So we hired some healers, psychic healers, to clear the energy of the space. Psychic, yes. One of them said, if she is screaming so much, it means that she is still in the accident. She hasn't come out of the accident yet. So you need to have someone to tell her she's not in the accident anymore. She's safe. to tell her because you know 
People don't believe in that kind of stuff. So I was calling her twice a day. And I remember it was the 3rd of July, 2005. And I was telling her on the phone, listen, you are not in the accident anymore. You're safe. Nobody is going to hurt you. You're back in the United States, and you are okay. And I said that six times, and she stopped screaming, and she said, okay. It's like nothing you can expect. It's like nothing you can really explain. Eight years out, we're much better at not crying when we talk about it. You all know what the M1A1 Abrams is. They don't know. The M1A1 Abrams was the new ticket for combat when the century turned. They were the baddest boys on the planet, but they can't work alone. What happens if a track breaks? Those tracks are seven tons a piece. You put them back together by hand. You do that, while you're under fire. You put them back together by hand. And if something goes wrong with him, with that Abrams? You would see me. Trying to get that tank out of combat. Like you would drag a soldier that's been shot. You drag him out of combat by hand. But the Abrams weighs 69.1 four tons. Almost 70 tons of hate and discontent, as we call them. My job is to make sure that trooper that weighs 70 tons gets out of the zone. Because he's hurt. We actually refer to our tanks with names. We named them. We talked to them. We lived in them. We got tired of them. And when we got away from them, we wanted to come back to them. You know, those were our homes. Those were our biggest partner. Was a tank. Our train is changed, our targets change, the kind of operations change. We drilled it in the dirt and we drilled it in the woods and then we changed into the open field. 
We knew the change was coming. We knew the war was coming. We knew that all the changes meant that something big was coming. My staff sergeant approached me. He looked at me. He said, Lance Corporal Bell, I need you. And my heart was filled with dread. He said, it's time to go. Go get your gear and find your stuff. You only have three hours and that has to be enough. That's all that I was given. Just three hours. Say goodbye. I was in my camouflage and I got to the front door of my little duplex right outside the gate of Camp Lejeune. I opened my front door, my wife came up and hugged me. She always did. And the moment we embraced each other, she pulled back and said, what's wrong? I said, Melissa, I got the call. I have three hours. And she fell to pieces. I got a little story for you. 
and it goes like this. When I was 18, I used to look in people's windows. And if they weren't home, I would steal their stuff. Yeah. But that's what happens when you grow up in chaos. Sad story, right? I can tell you're looking for a little more. Okay. I wasn't a bad kid. Just a little bit wild. Yeah. Just a little wild. And so I found myself in front of a judge. And I had to make a choice. Jail or boot camp? The choice was clear. You got it. From there, it was early morning push-ups, long days on an aircraft carrier, and desert storm. Discipline, baby. Becoming a man. Yeah. Becoming a Marine was a very serious instant in my life. In order to find myself, I had to lose myself. Lose myself completely. was called up in 2004 to active duty, and in 2006 he left in September for Afghanistan. And he was actually there for 10 days when I got a funny message from a Marine sergeant that said, we're in the area and we need to talk to you. Now, having been a military daughter, wife, and now mother, I don't know, I guess it didn't click. It was just like, okay, well, I'm at the hospital. And they said, we'll be right there. And then when I saw them in their dress blues, that was scary. And they said, he's not dead. Thank you.
Um, yes, sir. Actually, he was on his second deployment. He got tapped for a last minute deployment two weeks after we found out. I was pregnant with the twins and came back three days before they were born. So <laughs> yeah, resilience is definitely something that is needed in the military, 100%. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, you have to be resilient. You have to be strong. You have to be willing to put up with a lot of crap. And you have to be willing to fight for your marriage. Actually, I can't think of a single couple that we've known from when we first got married that is still together. So it's hard. Military life is hard. It's hard on everybody, and a lot of people just don't make it. like nothing you can expect it's like nothing you can explain it's empty empty but something remains the drapes, shut the door, turn away from what I knew before, folding in, falling out, waking up to this world of doubt, waking up to this world of doubt. It's like nothing you can expect. It's like nothing you can explain. It's empty, empty, but something remains.
He was called up in 2004 to active duty, and in 2006, he left in September for Afghanistan. And he was actually there for 10 days when I got a funny message that said, he's not dead. Do we still have time? Do we have a timekeeper out there? Do we? Ten minutes. Okay. So, um, what I normally do with the Resilience Project is kind of go back to this body practice before we get into our analytical thinking and our descriptive responses. Just sort of close your eyes and again. Feel your breath down into the bottoms of your feet. Notice if your body is having a response. And to just take that in, acknowledge it, it's important. It's what really matters. And then open your eyes if you have any questions. For these, what a great job you guys did. Wow, that was amazing. Can we have them introduce themselves? Yeah. I also want to say that the music was composed by Ben Judah Balkus, and his mother actually also um, is connected. She works at a VA hospital in California. Hi, everybody. My name is James Bowen, originally from Dallas, Texas. Hey, went to Kansas State University joined Axis Dance Company August of 2016. I'm excited to be here, everyone. <laughs> My name is Dwayne Schooneman. Um, I moved to Oakland two years ago to join Axis. I moved from Tampa, Florida. <laughs> My name is Julie Crothers. I grew up in Tennessee, studied dance in North Carolina, and moved to Axis moved to Oakland to join Axis in July of 2014. Hi, my name is Liv Schaefer. I am from Chicago, Illinois, and I studied dance in the Bay Area and joined Axis in August of 2016. And I, I want to mention that we have um, two other dancers and an apprentice also with us, and, and you'll get to see them if you're able to come to the Boston University residency. And Mark Brew, who's down here in the front, is our incoming artistic director. That's a bad word to use. Um, he's our new artistic director, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Oops. Anyone have a comment or a question or a feeling you want to express? Carla? Okay, <laughs> people heard that right. Yes. And I just want to say I'm, I'm almost moved to tears. I am so, so very moved, and that's what I want to share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Someone, is that Anthony back there? Who is that? Um. Thank you so much for that performance. That was absolutely amazing. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask about the music, the mood. I was trying to put words to it, and what I came up with was beautifully haunting. And I, I, I would just like to hear from you guys about um, 
uh, the music. Thank you. Well, I can talk about how the music came about because Ben Yudavakis is somebody I work with a lot in my work and uh, he likes to be in the process, in the rehearsal studio, feeling the temperature of what happening in various sections. I also, I'm always about colliding language and movement and seeing how they can, um, hmm, can complement each other but also maybe contradict each other, create a little friction or dislodge you from the perspective that you think you have on the language, that the movement can actually shift you into some new perspective. Uh, I like that, and Ben is very sensitive to that, uh, and that's not an easy collaborative moment when you tell um, a musician or a composer, maybe not so loud <laughs> or not so much music in this moment, because they gotta talk. And he's really, really great with that. But do you guys wanna talk about how it feels? Anybody? <laughs> I'm thinking about how it feels. Um, I don't know, Joe said everything. Uh, it was just interesting being in there. Uh, ben was totally um, immersed in the process and, and checking in and making little tweaks as we went along. Um, it was my first time having a musician in the studio. Is that, that's not really true, but first time I had to that extent. I don't know what else to say. It was pretty cool to see Ben and Joe work together and make those adjustments. Julie and, and Dwayne are the two, two of the dancers that were in the original process with Joe, and then Liv and James came in and, and took on roles, and you know both of them have their own challenges, so I just want to acknowledge that they were, Julie and Dwayne were really in the thick of it. Those two. And Dwayne helped me with some of the oral histories. Yes, Colleen. I would like to ask each of the, the dancers to talk a little bit more about the oral histories and how you embodied them. And, and as being a dancer, I'm always thrilled that dancers can talk and move at the same time. Dancers can talk. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yes, we can. Um, I'm also a fan of dancers who can talk. <laughs> um, I did my best to relate to my own personal history I feel that there are moments when I am the character that I spoke with my monologue, but then also the character that James spoke of when I was Melissa with Dwayne. Um, and I drew from my own experiences, having a loved one being far away, not being able to get in touch with them, and ultimately just had to take a different perspective every time I tried it, even from our run earlier this morning to today, playing with different cadences of speaking and different cadences in my movement, if I keep it alive in that way, I can keep the character alive for myself. Um, so play. When, when we were doing the interviews with the people, Joe was pretty clear that he wanted, for each of the interviews, it was Joe and his rehearsal assistant and then one of the dancers, but it ended up being that any text that we said was not the text that we heard. So. I, I wasn't able to even try and say it like it was said. And so then I really got to take it on as my own and recognizing it as not just a singular story that's relevant to one person, but really the grander scope and the human experience. And when I'm delivering my lines, I like to pretend that there's one specific person that I'm speaking to over there. Um, and that kind of helps me keep it alive because every show that interviewer or that person might be a little different. Julie said it all. Yeah, um, we weren't in the interviews for the parts that we spoke. Um, we were in other interviews, but I know for me, um, I feel a lot of a, uh, like I really want to get it right. I, I don't need to get it the same all the time, but I really want to get it right because I, I was in an interview with a, a woman who was injured in Iraq. And, um, you know, seeing her and her mother being there when they told their stories and then realizing that all these other interviews that Joe was doing probably had the same experience. 
uh, I really wanted to make sure that you know, that their stories came across in, in the way that they wanted them to, while also keeping it, as Julie said, um, you know, equivalent to the grander human experience. I wasn't part of the process of them being able to interview the veterans, but coming in as a new company dancer, um, it was difficult at first because I was trying to act like this person. I'm going to say his name is John. I don't know his name. I was trying to act like John, but then I started to play around with the idea of B. James telling this story. My name is James, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, just B. James because I'm, I'm a married man, and so I was just kind of putting myself in this situation telling my husband that I have to go back overseas and I don't know if I'm going to come back the same. So that's what the process was for me. Yeah. I, I will say that um, the woman that Dwayne spoke about who had the traumatic brain injury, she and her mother and her um, therapist actually came to the showing of the piece, the preview that we did of the piece. And um, this piece is really emotional for me still. Um, and to see them after the performance and um, how gratified they all felt that their story had been revealed that way, um, I think was for me one of the highlights of actually um, putting this project together. Don't make us cry. <laughs> I cry at commercials. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if there's a retreat. Um. I have the feeling we might be running out of time, but is there, yeah. Okay, um, well, thank you. Um, I feel like you all really unearthed so many incredibly touching, honest, hard moments, both in the movement and the text and the way it all came together. Um, I know that on tour, and this piece has toured quite extensively, um, that you all did uh, interact with different veteran communities and military communities and groups while the work was in different communities, and in addition to what you've shared about the creation of the work, is there anything that stands out to you all um, in your experiences on tour um, that, that might be really important for this group to hear? I remember one time when we went, when we went to a veterans hospital and did a workshop, um, one of the veterans came up to me because I did this scene speaking the lines about the tanks up there. And uh, exactly like Julie and I were saying, like, and really everybody was saying, um, we wanted to get these stories right. He came up to me and said, that was my story. He was like in tears and uh, sort of relieved. And he was telling me how that was his story. Like that's everything he went through. And it, he was, you know, felt so um, happy that we were sharing that with everybody. Um, and that was, uh, you know, going to VA hospitals and having more of those experiences was uh, pretty deep. Yeah. Um, my favorite moment of those workshops is often right when we go in. We, we do a movement with the veterans before we share the piece with them and help them to open their bodies and open their hearts. And they are often very reluctant. So we walk in and are matching Access Dance t-shirts and they're not sure what they're in for and maybe have just popped a can of soda sitting back with their bros. And then we're like, okay, everyone get up, and no one wants to get up. And then just kind of watching the transition into, all you have to do is follow what I'm doing. Let's turn on some funky music, and giving them the space where, okay, now you create a move, and watching like just the creativity explode, I think really sets the scene physically and mentally and spiritually to be able to then digest this work that is so heavy on all of our hearts. So it's really satisfying by the end. I'm always pretty fascinated as we go into each of the workshops we maybe sometimes create a different order to things. Uh, maybe there's a showing of the work at the end, which is usually the case for us. Um, but the difference between when you show a work and then you dance together versus when you dance together and then you show a work, um, I don't know that one is better than the other, but this setting is one that it really draws out a lot of high contrast, you know, in terms of when you make that connection with people one-on-one, -on -one, 
Um, maybe it's a little easier after they've seen us divulge and enter into their world and say, I, I can step into that with you. Um, and how the relationship is different and vice versa. Um, to echo what most of them have said, um, it is a cool experience to go in to a veteran workshop and get them up to move. Um, another cool thing for me is that we, when they come up to us and they tell us how cool it is for us to be able to share their story through our movement and how they could connect to our movement, I think that's um, probably a powerful thing for me going into these workshops. Because I mean, they're not dancers, so for us to be able to show them this and then they can relate to it is the bomb. <laughs> well, I'll, I just want to add one more thing to that because I think it's important for this person who I brought it up. Actually, there was a family member at a workshop one time and they came up and really thanked us um, because the parts of the family, you know, the family serves as well. And that story doesn't always get told. And I remember someone, and I just wanted to share that because it was so important to him that we did that. Thank you very much.